where God's people need to be. So we are uh, thrilled that you're here this morning, and uh, it's a gorgeous day outside. It would have been a good day for a parking lot service, but I'd rather be indoors. So we're glad that you're with us this morning. We're going to begin this morning with reading a few verses from Psalm 25. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. Yea, let none that wait on thee be ashamed. Let them be ashamed which transgress without cause. Show me thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths. Lead me in thy truth and teach me, for thou art the God of my salvation. On thee do I wait all the day. And so we're thrilled that we are here together. We're thrilled that we serve a God that is on the throne and uh, is aware of everything that's going on around us. And uh, we're thrilled that we can come together and praise his name. So let's have a word of prayer and we'll get started this morning. Father, we are truly grateful for this opportunity to be together, to be in your house, to be able to sing your praises, to be able to fellowship one with another. And Father, I pray that you may indeed do something special in this place this morning. May we sense your presence. May you, Father, work in each and every heart this morning. We thank you, Father, for the opportunity which is ours to gather together to celebrate our fathers. And I pray, Lord, that you may bless our men, that you may challenge them this morning, that you may encourage them, and that, Father, you may bless them for their faithfulness to you. We pray these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Danny, would you come? That's quite an entrance. <laughs> Good morning. It's good to see everyone here this morning, and it's a lot better to be up here leading singing when I know somebody else is singing besides me. <laughs> morning and happy Father's Day to all those fathers that are here. <clears throat> Let's stand and sing Our God Reigns. <laughs> Thank you. 
no graphics and no excitement, but we've got a bunch of slides for you this morning just to welcome you back into the building. By the way, let me welcome to the service this morning for the first time Mr. and Mrs. Richard and Michaela Braun. All right, so let's get to our slides. I think we've got a picture of them later in. Uh, our office hours are expanding again. Uh, we're going to be in the office Wednesday, Thursdays, and Fridays from 8.30 to 12.30. Uh, once we are back to 30% capacity, then we will be back to regular office hours. So uh, if you need anything at the building, just pop by Wednesday, Thursday, or Friday, and we will be here. Congratulations to Michaela and Richard Braun, who were married yesterday at noon hour out on the front lawn. And we are, we're so excited. It was a beautiful ceremony. The weather held off. It was just absolutely perfect. And so many of the church family were here yesterday in the parking lot for the first ever drive-in wedding. <laughs> and uh, we, uh, it, was, it was an exciting event. So we are glad that they're here. Kind of surprised they're here, but we are glad to see them. Deacons meeting, uh, Deacons, we are meeting Tuesday evening uh, in the main adult classroom at 7 o'clock. So if we can ask our deacons to be here, uh, we have a lot to go through, and so we encourage you to be here on time, and we'll get started and get you out of here as fast as we can. We are scheduling Believer's Baptism for Sunday, July the 25th. So there are many of you that had spoken to me about wanting to be baptized. And so we want you to mark that date on your calendar. And uh, we are going to try to accommodate the baptismal service in both services, both the 9 and 11. Uh, it's going to be the first time we've had to do that. But we are looking forward to getting a number of our folks uh, baptized on that Sunday. If you are saved, if you trusted Christ as your Savior, but you have never been through the waters of believer's baptism, we encourage you to speak to myself or Brenda and let us know and we will make sure that we give you some information. Our next steps class is going to begin July 18th. That is for anyone that is new at Golden Harvest and would like to know more. If you are new and you want to know more about the church, what we believe, uh, where we're headed, and how you can fit in, uh, we have a four-week membership class. Now, the, the, we call it a membership class, but you don't have to join. Uh, if you just want to come and find out more about the church, we would love to have you join our Next Steps class. That will be Sunday, July the 18th at 10 o'clock during the Sunday School Hour. And uh, we would encourage you, if you're planning on coming, let me know so that we can make sure we have a room that's large enough uh, for the numbers. There is a Sunday school meeting this coming Thursday evening at 7 o'clock. We want to touch base with all of our children's ministry workers. We are planning on getting our children's ministry launched completely the first Sunday of July. And so we need to touch base with all of our Sunday school workers. If you are new to the church and you'd like to be involved in Sunday school, you'd like to be helping in some fashion, uh, you're invited to come to that meeting as well. So that's this Thursday night at 7 o'clock in the large adult classroom. South Argo Life Ministries, their spring fundraising campaign wraps up today. Uh, it is the baby bottle campaign minus the baby bottles. So you can go online and make a donation. Uh, I'm sure they would even accept it after today uh, if you wanted to make a donation online. But you can go to their website, SouthNagraLifeMinistries.com. Uh, our Wednesday night Bible study is going to be back in the auditorium. We are excited. And uh, we're going to be here 7 o'clock Wednesday night. We will live stream it, but we will not be live streaming until about 10 or quarter after. Once our prayer time is done, we will go online. So we are back in the book of Ephesians, and uh, we're looking forward to being able to have discussion rather than you sit at home and watch me behind my desk talking to a camera. So I, I, uh, I prefer this method a lot better. 
All right, that's all of our announcements. I'm surprised. I thought there'd be a few more. I, Danny, you might as well come. Let's stand and sing Faith of Our Fathers. <laughs> Thank you. 
And so I pray today that as we address our men, that you may speak to each and every one of them. And Father, that we may be men that are yielded to your Holy Spirit. We may be men that are obedient to the Word of God. That we may be men that are leading our families, that are setting the example. And that, Father, men in which Jesus Christ can be clearly seen. And Lord, I pray today that you may accomplish your will in each of our hearts, mine included. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. The question has been asked more than once, what is a father? A gentleman by the name of Ham Mobley helps us with the answer with an informative and entertaining way. Ham Mobley wrote this, Between the joy of bridegroom and the pride of grandfather, we find a bewildered human being called a father. Fathers come in varying degrees of education, influence, temperament, and wealth. But all fathers have the same hope or dread to make life easier in every way for their offspring and to sacrifice with diligence a virtue acquired after the first baby until the job is done. Fathers are busy doing most everything, piloting planes, making music, presiding as president, pushing pencils, building buildings, selling suits, digging ditches. Wives try to remake them. Daughters have a way with them. Mothers still try to baby them. Fathers think they are a chip off the old block, and sons worship them. A father is a Babe Ruth without hitting a home run, a Solomon without going to school, a Rockefeller without the next house payment, and a Rock Hudson, even without hair. Rock Hudson, that's for you young people. You'll have to look that up on Google. <laughs> when daughters have dates, a father is an unnecessary, thoughtless, interrupting fixture about the house. When his wife wants him to repair something, he has a thousand other things to do first or else he must buy an $80 set of tools to do a 25 cent job. <laughs> Fathers must like, or pretend to like, hot dogs, peanuts, banana splits, library teas, overnight hikes, birthday parties, all day swimming, getting up early on Saturday, going to the zoo, popular music, and spinach. He must dislike, or pretend to dislike, second helpings of dessert, sleeping late on Saturday, and fast driving. Nobody else carries in his head such knowledge as how flies walk on the ceiling. Mickey Mantle's batting average in 1955, the oldest nursery rhyme, the latest hip tune, and why the fish aren't biting, and how to have one car at two places at the same time. You might as well admit it, He's your Prince Charming, your coach, your banker, your advisor, and your pal. An unyielding, non-understanding, old-fashioned fuddy-duddy who still sticks out his chest when he hears you say, that's my dad. So men, if you are here today and you are a father, we wish you a happy Father's Day. You deserve a treat. Ladies, did you hear that? He deserves a treat. Maybe some dessert or a second helping. Either way you look at it, it sounds like quite a job. And it is quite a job. And I would be tempted to say that it is a job that is growing increasingly difficult in today's world. And many of you, I'm sure, would agree with that statement. But I suppose it's never been easy to be a father. There have always been times where the burden of being a dad was heavy. And still we seem to be having a shortage of men who will take up the mantle and will be fathers. Not biological fathers, but fathers that are present every single day 
in every single circumstance. Men that are willing to be true fathers to their children. Today we can echo the message given by God to Jeremiah that we need men. Here in Jeremiah chapter 5, God is uh, pronouncing to Israel through Jeremiah that judgment is coming. And Jeremiah understands that judgment is coming, and he understands why judgment is coming. But Jeremiah is having a difficult time believing that there is not at least one good godly man that may be able to sway the judgment of God. The hope of our society today, I believe, hinges largely on our men and on our fathers. We have an increase in crime. We have a disrespect for authority. We have a, a, a total disregard for the value and sanctity of human life. And much of that is because there is an increase in fatherless homes throughout North America where homes where fathers are completely absent, where they have abandoned their families, and young people are growing up without the influence of a father. And then there are other homes where children are growing up with a father present, but he is present physically only. He's not present spiritually or emotionally. He comes home from work, he puts his feet up, and that's the last anyone sees of him. Man, we need to be godly men. Whether you are a father or not, this country needs godly men. This church needs godly men. And so today we find a man as God desires in what we're going to be looking at today. Ezekiel chapter 22 and verse 30 says, And I sought for a man among them that should make up the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land, that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Jeremiah 17, 10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doing. So I believe this morning that God is still searching for men. He is still searching for hearts that will follow hard after him. And I think on this Father's Day that we need to see just the type of man that God is indeed looking for. This is not a, uh, uh, an exegetical message by any stretch of the imagination. It's not necessarily expository. I'm simply taking Jeremiah chapter 5 and verse 1, and we're going to launch out into what I believe God is looking for in a godly man today. Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 1, it says, Run ye to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem, and see now and know, and seek in the broad places thereof, if ye can find a man. If there be any that executeth judgment, that seeketh the truth, and I will pardon it. So God has said to Jeremiah, if you can find at least one man, just one, then I will pardon Jerusalem. I will not bring judgment upon my people. And Jeremiah, at this point in time, is hopeful that he can find at least one man. And so God tells him to run to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem, to check out the broad places and see if he can find a man, a man that executes judgment and seeks the truth. I believe today that God is looking for men of conviction, men of conviction, men that are committed to the truth. Men who will accept the word of God as being the final authority and will live under that authority and will lead their families under that authority. Jeremiah's generation was one that felt that they could say one thing and that they could do another. 
that they could just live as they wanted if they just said the right things at the right time. It reminds us of today, but it also reminds us of, of uh, Jerusalem at the time of Christ because the Pharisees were exactly the same way. They would say one thing, they would commit rules to others to obey, but then they would do whatever they want. Jeremiah's generation was one that was sick with sin, was one that had rebelled against God. And folks, if you look around objectively today in our country, you will find that this is a country that has rejected God. It has rejected the authority of God. It has rejected the word of God. And because we have rejected the word of God, the values that that word portrays and teaches have been thrown out the window. And men have been shaped by the culture around them. You know, there is a, 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 a lot of discussion today about being sensitive to the culture of the day in which we live. You know, the church was never intended to be influenced by the culture of the day. The culture of the day was to be influenced by the church. We are to be the ones that set the bar. We are to be the ones that raise the standard. We are to be the ones that live righteously and set an example for those around us so that they can see how God wants his people to live. What kind of example are we leaving our children in terms of the truth, in terms of standing up for what we believe in? Are we indeed today living out our faith? I came across this story of James Dobson and his faithful parents. James Dobson wrote this in relationship to his mom and dad. He said, of all the values transmitted to me by my father, none made a more lasting impression than his attitude towards money. As an evangelist, he could never depend on the compensation he would be given. The local church would collect a free will offering from my father, but many times the gifts were barely sufficient to pay his traveling expenses. Furthermore, he would usually stay with the pastor during a 10-day revival. While there, he would often observe that the children needed shoes or books or medication. On the final night of his revival meetings, when the modest offering was given to him, my dad would take enough money to get home and then donate the balance to meet the needs of the pastor's family. And then my dad would return to be greeted by my mother and me. And I can still hear the conversation between my good parents. Did you have a successful revival, my mother would ask? The Lord was with us, my dad would reply. How much did they pay you? Well, I need to talk to you about that. My father would usually say, Grim. I know, mom would say, you gave it all away, didn't you? My mother would invariably sanction his decision, saying that if my dad felt that way, it was all right. God had always taken good care of us and would continue to do so. A few days later, when the bills began to accumulate, our little family would gather on our knees before the Lord, and Dad would pray first. Lord, you know that we've been faithful with the resources you've given us. We've tried to be responsive to the needs of others when you laid them on our hearts. Now, Lord, my family is in need. You said, give, and it shall be given unto you. And so we bring to you our empty meal barrel and ask you to fill it. As a child, I listened intently to these prayers and watched carefully to see how God responded. I tell you without exaggeration that money invariably arrived in the next few days. God did not make us rich as some ministers promised today. But he never let us go hungry. On one occasion, $1,200 arrived in the mail the day after this hard up family prayer. My, my childlike faith grew by leaps and bounds. 
at this demonstration of trust and sacrifice by my father and mother. James Dobson had a father that trusted God. James Dobson had a father that led by example who put his money where his mouth was, who didn't just talk the talk, but he walked the walk. We all know that James Dobson became the founder and lead of Focus on the Family Ministries. So I think that his dad and mom did pretty good in raising their son. God needs men today. Not all of us have had the privilege of growing up in Christian homes. Not all of us have had the opportunity to be influenced by godly men as we grew up in our formative years. Many of you have gone through circumstances that were less than ideal. You have been raised in a home that was dysfunctional at best and it was absolutely horrendous at worst. But yet those things, those influences, those hardships are not to be used as excuses for us to be able to slough off and do what we wish. We as Christian men must rise above whatever circumstances are in our past. We must lay aside what has been part of our life. And we must take this book and allow it to form us into the men that God wants us to be today. You know, I'm not sure if you're aware, but there are some really principleless people in this world. People that are just conniving, are rascals, and have no qualms about hurting someone else, or robbing someone else, or cheating someone else. But that ought never to be said about the household of faith. It ought never to be said that you and I, as men of God, have cheated someone, have told a lie, have lived contrary to the profession of faith that we hold so dear. Thank God for fathers today who take their faith seriously. And as I make that statement, I have several names and faces that come to my mind. Men that have been faithful. Men that are truly leading by example. But not only does God want men of conviction, but I believe God wants men of action. God desires men who treat each other with dignity and fairness. To do what is right because it is the right thing to do. You know, uh, your character is seen in how you behave when you're alone. Right? We have, everybody has the public persona, right? That, that image that we have when we come to church. You know, that we got it all together. I, I'm, I'm living life high and things are great and I'm rejoicing in the Lord and I love the Lord so much. And then we walk out the church doors and there's a shift. Now there shouldn't be, right? Are you with me this morning? Am I off base? There shouldn't be a shift in the way we behave or the way we talk or the way we think. It should be consistent from the time you walk into church to the time you walk out until you walk back in again. But there is that private persona, that private person. And my friends, what you are when you are alone is who you really are. Those things that you involve yourself in when no one is watching and no one is around and no one will ever find out, that is who you really are. And so today we don't necessarily need men that talk the talk. We need men that walk the walk. Right? I, I think 
Somebody that was here in this church at one point in time said this, and I'm going to try to get it right. That your walk talks and your talk talks, but your walk talks louder than your talk talks. Did you get that? And by the way, I think it was me that said that. <laughs> your walk talks, it speaks volumes how we live our life. In our talk talks. But what you do speaks so much more loudly than what you say. God help us to be men of action. God help us to be men who back up what we say with how we live. That we do what is right because it is right before God. That we do what the word of God says not because it's convenient because God said it. Jeremiah was challenged to find a single man who acted in righteousness. In Ezekiel 22, God was seeking for a man to make up the hedge and stand in the gap. And he couldn't find one. Isaiah chapter 6 verse 8 says, Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Who shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, then said I Here am I. Send me. So as our children watch us, will they see fathers who complain about this world but never do anything about injustice or unrighteousness? Do they see us do the bare minimum? Do they see us cheat our employers or the government? Do they see us stretching the boundaries of acceptable conduct? Or will they see us doing the right thing in every situation? Will they see us honor God in every area of our lives? Folks, that's what God's looking for today. He's not just men, but men and women who will live their faith completely Monday through Sunday. That what they say they mean. And what they say they believe, they live out. Thirdly, I believe God wants men of compassion. God wants men who will care. You know, we have been shaped by Hollywood in our, our attitudes towards what men should be. Uh, and again, I'm going to drop a name that some of you young people will have to look up on Google. We have the John Wayne mentality. <laughs> right? How many of you young people know the name John Wayne? All right. I, I'm surprised there's several of you put your hands up as young people that I wouldn't have included in that number. John Wayne was old Hollywood movie star that was a man's man. I mean, he was macho, and he was just the epitome of manhood. We've allowed that model to affect how we think a man should be. I believe men, God wants men of compassion. Men who care. Men who love those around them with the love of Christ. The problem in Jeremiah's day was that people had grown callous to the hurting around them. The people were in pain and suffering all around them and it did not impact these people. It's not much different than it is today. And we brought the macho mentality of Hollywood into the church today. If we bought into the idea that men should never cry, that men should be tough, that men should be just, I don't know, the big shot, tough guy, I'm afraid we have in many ways. Where when God seeks for a man, he's looking for a man whose heart is tender. He's looking for a man whose heart is sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit of God. 
Folks, it doesn't take a lot of figuring out that what we need today are men who live Christ-like lives. Who live Christ-like lives. What I'm saying is that Jesus Christ is our greatest example. He is the example of how we ought to conduct ourselves, how, how we ought to be communicating with each other, how we ought to be thinking about our Heavenly Father, and how we ought to be thinking about our duty and relationship to God. Look at him and you will see a man of conviction. Look at him and you will see a man of action. But I believe as well, if you look at Jesus Christ, you'll see a man of compassion. David wrote in Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Men, today God is interested in the condition of your heart. And he is still looking for men that are men after his heart. Henry and Tom Blackaby co-authored a book together by the title of The Man God Uses. And in that book they write this. No one can have a heart in one condition and produce fruit of an opposite condition. The condition of your heart will affect your actions and your actions reflect your heart. How's your heart today, man? How's your heart today? I appreciate and I love each and every one of you and it's good to be back home. And I know that there are many men out here in this auditorium this morning and those who will come to the 11 o'clock service who are serious about living for God, who are serious about taking their faith and putting it into action Monday through Sunday. But if you're kind of on the fence, if you're kind of just laissez-faire, so-so, lukewarm, I think it's time to get off the fence. I think it's time to commit yourself to following Jesus Christ, to lead your family. God help us that if similar circumstances come about in our lifetime, similar to what Jeremiah went through, that when that person who is commissioned by God to run to and fro through the streets to try and find a man, that they will find one here and one here and one here and one there. Men of conviction, men of action, and men of compassion. God help us to be men. God needs them today. The church needs them today. And the Lord knows our country needs them today. Father, Thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity to gather together, to fellowship, to sing your praises, to just be in your house. Lord, what a precious, precious opportunity this is. Lord, I pray that you may bless each of our people. This morning we pray a special blessing upon our men. We pray, Father, that you would bless our fathers. We thank you for them. Lord, I pray that you may help each of us as men to look at our lives today, to see if these three attributes are present in our life. And Lord, when you call for a man to stand in the gap and make up the hedge, that you will find men that are willing to do that. We pray these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>
Thank you.